It's a pleasure for me to welcome again Gilberto Perez as our guest. He has been with us before, but just a quick reminder, Gilberto serves as Vice President for Student Life and Dean of Students at Goshen College. He served at Goshen College for 10 years. Prior to coming to Goshen College, served as a mental health administrator and bilingual therapist in Novo and LaGrange counties. Serves on the board of directors of a small not-for-profit organization in Goshen called Community Pro Education. Roberto also serves as a board chair, you may remember, for MCC US. He's in his third year as a Goshen City Councilman. He's married to Denise Diener. They have three young adult children that live in Kenya, Cambridge, and Goshen. Am I correct that your daughter in Goshen is in college? She's a flute player. And any of you who were in the uh, Friday evening orchestra concert heard her playing, uh, playing flute with the uh, orchestra. I shared with Gilberto that uh, we're having a series of Sundays focused on being a multicultural congregation. Planning committee is aware that for the past number of years, Goshen College has been moving toward having as much as 25% or more of the student body identifying as Hispanic. And we invited Gilberto to reflect on the college's experience in making the campus a welcoming place for persons from various multicultural backgrounds. Might there be insights from their experience that could help a congregation be a welcoming place for an increasing number of Hispanics? He accepted the invitation and said, yeah, I'd be willing to share a few thoughts about it. Roberto, thanks for coming, sharing with us. We look forward. It is good to be here with you this morning. Again, my name is Gilberto Perez Jr. and I am serving currently, at, that doesn't mean anything, just currently, uh, as the Vice President of Student Life and Dean of Students here at Goshen. I've been in that role for five years. And the other years so here at Goshen, I taught two years in the social department as an associate professor of social work. My career has been in social work. So for about 18 plus years, I spent time working with children, spent time working with older adults who were at the end stage of life. So I was a hospice social worker. I spent a lot of time with individuals who were right at the end. And I walked with a lot of families who were right at the end and we walked right on through. Mm -hmm on what it was to lose their spouse, their son, their daughter, all of that good work. And then I've also spent a lot of time here in Noble and LaGrange County, also DeKalb and Steven as a therapist and mental health administrator. So I spent a lot of years sitting with people in broken spaces where they just don't know where to go, or how to solve a problem or how to deal with mental illness now that it's clear to them that their family member has a mental illness or they themselves come to the clarity that, ah, something is not going to be right anymore. It'll be different for me. And part of the work of all that, you never really think about all the things you do and life and you do, but Think about the things you do in life, and then all of a sudden you're doing this job. And sometimes it feels like you have a, have a whole big outpatient office, <laughs> like right across the tracks. 
Because they come with so many, so many dreams. Young people come with so many dreams, so many exciting things about what they want to be in the future. And they kind of forget that today is really important to prepare for the future. Um, it is a joy to actually be in that role of, so I kind of think of the two roles of Vice President of Student Life and Dean of Students as really two roles, which they are. The Vice President role has a lot to do with helping and sitting with other Vice Presidents uh, on the President's Cabinet to think strategically about the, the direction of the institution. What is our, what are our compelling interests as Vice Presidents to get this institution to go forward? What is the president's compelling interest for what she is bringing to the institution through her leadership? Right. So, so we're about that. And so we sit and we think about enrollment. We look at trends of how students are coming or not coming. Ocean College today has the fewest students it has had for a long time. We only have 699 full-time equivalent students compared to uh, a couple of decades ago, we're actually with about 1,034. I'll give some statistics on that in a little bit. But all of that work as, as it has unfolded for me being at Ocean College as a vice president has been interesting to think about the change that is happening for us at the institution mm -hmm. around very specific work becoming a Hispanic serving institution, which is in some ways a federal designation that the Department of Education has given to institutions of higher education that have a enrollment of over 25%. The Department of Education identified minority serving institutions as those who would have multiple numbers of students of color and also designates them as that. The Dean of Students role is one of, I get all kinds of texts, I get all kinds of phone calls, at different times of the day and hours of the night, where we have situations with students who need help, who need staff, who needs a little bit of guidance in terms of how to work with different situations of crises, so having myself dealt with a lot of those situations as a therapist and mental health administrator, so when I think, I feel like I have an outpatient office over here, it's because I spent a lot of time in outpatient offices listening and, and, and getting people to the place where they needed to be in terms of hospitalization. And I give you that information just as a, as a backdrop for, I think, for what is, what is in some ways at Goshen College happening to us as we are moving from an institution that continues to be predominantly white uh, in terms of our faculty, staff, and as an organization, but we are moving um, and we are inching toward becoming a more intercultural community. And there are all kinds of definitions for intercultural because we can talk about, uh, I think Bell even talked about multicultural. List definitions are what's multicultural? And then we could think about what's intra-culture, and then what's cross-culture, and what's inter-culture. All kinds of definitions. And a number of years ago, when President uh, Jim Brenneman was here, we really were tapped by the Lilly Endowment to really kind of hone in on this idea of intercultural community. And it's really a coming together of, 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 of many but then trying to understand each other uh, as we have those differences, so living in difference in that. So my Dean of Students role, just even this morning, getting an, e an email from my campus safety director, sort of saying, oh, we have this situation. And so, okay, well, I'm not gonna think about that right now, um, but, but they just come. But it's a joy to sit with students that come into the office, into my office, and tell me about their dreams, about what they wanna do. And it's really my, my task to help them think about the now. So I have a young man in, in here at the college who is wanting to develop an organization that works with black males when he leaves Goshen College. 
young black men. So, and he himself was a young black male. He liked to really help young people from his ethnic group get along and, and move forward. And so he's thinking about what he's going to do after he's done Goshen College. And part of the work that I believe I'm responsible to do is to help students stay here. Like you live here right now. So what are you going to do right now to make this organization live? So I encouraged him, think about starting this organization of yours as a club, as an organization at Goshen College. Work with young black males your age here at Goshen College. How can you support them? Let them know that something will be there for other young black males as you go forward. So he launched with us in Student Life a, an organization called Vessel of Honor. So now he has Student Life support. He has an advisor. I mean, we have, he has two advisors. He is working on different activities that he'll do with young black males in the community, but also with males from Coaching College. He's receiving some seed money to just test some things, right? test some things. And now he writes to me all the time, which is great. I love it. So what do I do about this? And I thought about that. Let's sit down. Have you talked to your professor? Have you talked to your business professor? Have you talked to entrepreneurship professor? So again, even this transformation that's happening to us, I, I like to think of it as we are helping to guide young people to the things that God has for them in the future. And so I don't know if any of you actually came across this. It's called Setting the Agenda, Meditations for the Organization's Souls. It's uh, edited by Edgar Stays and Rick and Stiffney. It's a, it's a devotional book for administrators within this, I think at this one I understand, for administrators who uh, are within our Mennonite institutions. And they're just wonderful uh, examples of how administrators can sort of think about the work that they're doing and if it's grounded in scripture and grounded in some amount of apps values for us. And uh, I want to read just a little bit from here as I get started and I'll kind of walk us through with some data and then give you a little bit of a window of what you know, Bill talked about, uh, how Goethe College is becoming a welcoming place. And I like to be a little bit more specific. I want to say uh, in my own interpretation, so this is not, you know, how sometimes People say, well, these are my, my own personal statements. It's not representing exactly what the college, but uh, I'm in a position that I'm in, engaged in a lot of different things so and, and know a lot of different things about the institution that um, somewhat goes to college, but there's probably a lot of me in this as well. But this one is written um, by... Christopher J. Doyle of Greenville, South Carolina. And at that point, he was an executive director of African Enterprise and was earlier a president of CEO of American Leprosy Missions. And he starts with the scripture uh, and he titles his present his, his writing here, Vision Driven to Do God's Work. And the passage he chooses is Jeremiah 29, 11, which I think all of us will be familiar once I read it. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And I'm only going to read his first sentence because I think it's key to what Goshen College has been attempting to do these last number of years. And it says, organizations need a clear and compelling vision to guide their planning. Read that again. Organizations, and I'm going to add now, and congregations. And here we go. This is about you all, not about me. This is about you all here at College Mennonite Church. Organizations need a clear and compelling vision 
to guide their planning. I brought this book here. So I read different types of books. And this one is called Our Compelling Interests. It's a very interesting book on higher education. It's a, it's a very fascinating book that really looks at the value of diversity. But then they go on more specifically to say the value of diversity for democracy and a prosperous society. And there are a number of things here that I, uh, that I have found very interesting. That's a lot of data, which is fine. But then um, it really starts to talk about diversity in the workplace and the marketplace. And we can think specifically about Goshen College as a workplace for many of us. And even for students when they arrive, it is a workplace. They, they are being invited to listen a little bit about what is happening to them. I'm going to give you a couple of dates here. So in 1929, does anybody know what happened in 1929 at Goshen College? It shut down for a year. Well, yeah, right around there. Do you also, maybe it was, I, you would know specifically, but there was also a young man that came from Chicago in 1929, and his name was David Castillo. He was a Mexican-American who lived in Chicago and came to study here at Goshen College, and he was studying a Bible. Was the first Mexican American or the first Latino to actually arrive at Goshen College. In the 1940s, there was another gentleman that came here. His name was Octavio Romero. So if you walk by the student apartments, you'll see this name there that says Octavio Romero. Octavio Romero didn't graduate from Goshen College. He came for two years, studied biology or chemistry or something like that. And then he goes off and finishes his college degree somewhere else. And then at some point in his journey, as he is older, he contacts Goshen College and says, I want to give a lot of money to Goshen College for scholarships. Fascinating. He made his money in the oil industry, and you know, you can think about what well, should we accept that? <laughs> All kinds of climate change. <laughs> All these kinds of things, right? But something happened to him here in two years that he left and he gave a substantial amount of dollars to help young Latinos move forward in their education at Kosher College. The late 70s, 80s, did anyone know what uh, was developed here at Goshen College? SST, yes. So late 60s, I think, or something like that. SST was an extremely um, risk. It was risky. Send students across the globe, try to get there. But it was leading the way. A little bit after that, so probably late 70s, maybe early 80s, uh, there was another thing that happened at Goshen College. Anybody know what that was? Related to Latinos and Hispanics. Hispanic Ministries at Goshen College was developed. There was an intentional, there was a honing in, there was a paying attention to something that was happening across the country in Mennonite Church USA, or I'm sorry, Mennonite Church probably at that time, and in the Hispanic Mennonite Church. Mennonite Minority Ministries Council was developing, which brought Native American, Latinos, Blacks to work together. Goshen College was at the forefront of welcoming Latino families from across the country to come and live in Goshen College. And a lot of them lived across the street where now the foundation offices are. There used to be a house there that was college property. There were, uh, there were Latino families that lived there. There was a family from Iowa that lived in that house. And there were different families. There were families that lived on College Avenue. So if you're not aware, Goshen College owns all of the homes from 
starting at the tracks all the way to 12th Street on the south side. That's all of the houses. There's a new entrance on Penn Street, right? Goshen College owns all of those houses. Those houses in the 70s and 80s housed Hispanic students, Latino students from all across the country. Roy Jimenez and Ana, Gilberto Gaitan and Esther Gaitan, Gilberto and Elizabeth Perez, and their two children, Alma Ruth Perez and Gilberto Perez Jr. <laughs> Very interesting, right? You see the progression. Goshen College has been walking with this population, with this diverse population for decades. It's not today that the Latino population goes to college. Mr. John Yorty here was, John Yorty was also president in those years. Vic Stoltz was president of Vic Stoltz, who's Bill Good was teaching here at Laura Hirschberger here, and maybe many other things, others of you. I played basketball with Goshen College students when I was a sophomore in high school, and I sprained my ankle really bad in the union building. Mm -hmm. And every time I walk by the union building, sometimes I remember that fast pain because it really caused me a lot of problems at Goshen High School. Because I had to wear crutches, I had to have young crutches. And it was just not the greatest experience. In about 2000, so 80s, you know, and into the 90s, the Hispanic ministries is still going. A lot of families from the U.S. are coming, from Canada also. By the early 2000s, the, um, the Lilly Endowment approached Goshen College to see if they might be interested in creating uh, some very specific energy toward uh, Latino population. I'm not sure if Lily Endowment was aware of what was happening here in Elkhart County, but if in Elkhart County in the 90s, there was a really big migration of Latino population that came from the South. <clears throat> we also had uh, young people that were coming from Puerto Rico that were in this community, such as the Alvarez family and others, right? In in the 2000s, the Lily Endowment approaches us and, and the population in Goshen and Elkhart County is just continuing to increase. And you find that there are a lot of folks entering into the factories, into the manufacturing sector. There's another interesting thing happening at Goshen College right around that time. Put this up here. In 2000, uh, there were probably, at least in terms of some of the work that Dr. David Lind has done, uh, one of our sociologists, uh, he was doing some little bit of research for Dr. Stoltz, who was President Stoltz. And in uh, 2000, the college had just in total, not uh, students living in the residence halls, but in total in 2000, it had 1,043 students. In 2019, it had 907 students. I'll go back a little bit. In also 2015, it had 839. So we went up a little bit in those four years. And then I just mentioned that in 2022, we have 699 full time students. And um, you could uh, look at those numbers a little bit closely. But in those early 2000s, something also happens at Goshen College, which is there is a beginning of a more of a, a, a marked decline. In what student population do you think there's a marked decline in the 2000s at Goshen College? Yes. There is a there is a marked decline. How did you all know that? Like, how did you know there was a decline of Mennonite students in, in, in the 2000s? Anybody have an idea? What, what, what were you reading? Where did you know that? Where did you learn that? Grandchildren aren't coming. The other fascinating thing was that in, in the early 2000s, um, we still had about 60% of students, 61% who were Mennonite, but you still you started to see that decline. 
year in 2022, what, what would be a guess of yours of the percentage of Mennonite students at Goshen College? 23%. Oh, it is significant. It's a 23% coaching college. The other fascinating thing that happened in like in those mid 2000s to the later 2000 and 2019, you actually had an increase in local students at 61%. Fascinating. Goshen College has been an institution throughout its history that really welcomed Mennonite students and other students and some other students from the globe from where? Pennsylvania? Ohio? Puerto Rico? Illinois? Oregon? In 2019, 61% of the students at Goshen College are local students. Hmm? Something has happened in this community that local students now see Goshen College as a destination. It's a place where they now see that something is there for them. And it's not just for students out there. Something happens. The other thing that happened in 2019 in terms of the numbers compared to what they would have been in the past is Ocean College was now serving a lower socioeconomic student. So the Mennonite students who were coming to us were lots were students who had more resources, financial resources. They were connected to networks. They could stay with families in the community because they knew each other from different places. The young people that were coming to Goshen College in those 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s and 90s, they knew each other from where? From church camps, from youth uh, events from all kinds of activities that the Mennonite church hosted for many of you and your children, right? And in 2019, 33% of those students were first generation students. So, Part of our planning, as I talked about, is actually trying to learn. About the first generation experience, first generation student experience. Dell said, how do those learnings from what you have done could help College Mennonite Church? Well, we've been doing a lot of reading and a lot of engaging in different ways of how to interact with each other. So we're, so we're really trying to learn about how we are building our relationships with students. If you can't hear me, please raise your hand. So I have one person that cannot hear me, so I'm, and I, and I, hear, and I see the face, um, it, it troubles me. <laughs> so if those of you who hear me okay, you're going to hear me a little louder because I want everyone to have a good experience here. In 2022, 50% of the students at Goji College live off campus. We have a lot of residence halls that are not full. It's been a challenge because depreciation happens and maintenance to buildings who are not used. You have to continue that. You just can't let the building sit there. You have to go do something to it. In 2007, our students were 
uh, 45% were from Indiana. In 2019, 61% were from Indiana. In 2007, 21% of our students were Pell Grant. In 2019, 29%. In 2007, first generation were 28%. And in 2019, they were 37%. In 2007, Fifty-six percent of our students were Mennonite, and today they are 23, 24 percent. In 2000, 84 percent of our students were white, and in 2022, in 2019, it was 26 percent were. I'm sorry, uh, Hispanics. In 2000, anybody have an idea how many Hispanics, Latinos were at Goshen College and? in the year 2000? Just take a guess. 3%. In 2019, it was 26%. And in 2022, it is 39%. The biggest change which we've really seen has been in these last um, 10 to 12 years between 2010 and 2012 years, 2022, where that's been the biggest. The other thing that uh, we've been spending time at Goshen College, knowing that all of that change is happening in terms of transformation, We've been trying to, to look at books. Uh, we've been trying to think about how do you lead in a culture of change? And so we've been spending, at least myself, I've been spending a lot of time with my team because our student population is different. So I've been spending a lot of time with my team thinking about some key things that we need in our student life division, but also as an institution. And I think there are some key things that congregations also need which is enthusiasm. We must have enthusiasm. I see some grins. We must have enthusiasm. And the second thing we must have is we must have hope. We must have hope that the future is God's future and it's not our future for us to fix and to create. But it's a future that says it's going to be wild out there because God creates from the wild. There are things that happen out there that we sometimes don't understand. There's a really wonderful hymn in the Voices Together. And go look for it, hopefully this afternoon or sometime this week. It's 828. And it talks very specifically in that hymn about how the wild of God is of creating this earth from nothing. And then the third thing that congregations and colleges, I think, need is energy. They need a lot of energy. They need people to be out there. They need people to just be motivated and to go. And people need commitment. The other things that we have been learning at Goshen College these last number of years in that transformation is this chapter here in this book, and I hopefully you all can see the, this here. And I'm just going to walk around just real briefly. I have a colleague here at Ocean College. Her name is Rocio Diaz. She is from Guadalajara, Mexico. And the thing that she always helps Ocean College remember 
relationships, relationships, relationships. She hasn't even read this book. <laughs> what we have been finding for ourselves as an institution in this process of becoming more of a Hispanic serving place is that we must become people who are about relationships with other people. It was fascinating to walk into your uh, area here of the fellowship hall. What was going on there like between 10, 30, and 11? What happens there? Coffee, cafe, coffee. But it was beautiful to see an older congregant uh, who, uh, white, but then it was beautiful to see a Latino mid 40s, maybe 35, 40, sitting there with her, they were talking to each other. They were having coffee together and they were in relationship of listening to one another. So a lot of our work in these last number of years is where we are trying to help people and we're trying to create an environment, okay? Create an environment in where students, administrators, and staff and faculty can fulfill the mission of Goshen College, which is rooted in the way of Jesus. Sounds like a good college man and church thing to do, right? We're also saying to our peers across the region that we want to lead in this area. So there's no humility there, I'm sorry. We want to lead in this area because we believe that the region has changed. With the num num Elkhart County is number three in the state in terms of geography for the square, uh, square footage of space of the number of Latinos that live in the state. Gary, Indiana is number one. Marion County, number two. Who's number three? Elkhart County for the number of Latinos that live in that space. Reading an environment means you have to pay attention. So we're really trying to pay attention to the people that are coming. And so that coming of the people that are here, we're emphasizing how and trying to understand what is their life. And so we are spending a lot of time, at least in my interpretation, we are spending a lot of time doing what's called compassionate Welcoming. The not for profits in this county, and I would say very specifically in this city, have changed. When you think of a not for profit in the 70s and 80s, and probably even to the 90s, that was doing a lot of work with Latinos. Does anybody remember? Does they have a sense of who that not for profit was in our community? Awesome. La Casa of Goshen. Oh my goodness. A home, a place where many, many immigrants went to for support. Their vision has changed because organizations change. Their visions have changed. Can anybody think of an organization that's kind of out there right now that's really supporting immigrants? Center for Healing and Hope. How many of you received that Glimmer of Hope newsletter that was being sent by? Julia Schmidt, powerful, beautiful. Now a young man named Lauro Suniga will take on that role. By compassionate welcoming, I think about, um, and I've been reading also about Walter Brueggemann. So Walter Brueggemann does some writing around this idea of what, it, what, does, what does compassion mean? And compassion, at least to Brueggemann, he's saying in terms of what I read and I understood, he's, he's not saying that welcome and compassion is about, well, let me, let me help you. Let me give you a hand because you need some help because you're, you're downtrodden. Compassion, I, I feel pain for you. He actually says that it is public criticism of the leaders of the day by saying to them, and to say to the people, we as individuals will not take the pain that these individuals are having. And we're going we're gonna to tell you about it. 
We're going to tell you legislators that you should pass this legislation for this group of people because it will help them. And we've been doing that since the beginning of time for the scripture and, and the passages also said, you will treat the foreigner in this way. You will help the alien in this way, right? In terms of the scripture. It's not new to us. And so Goshen College is really, I think, taking this idea of we've been standing with immigrants when the immigration detention center wanted to be built here. So we said, no, we don't want that here. And we stood very loudly. Richard Aguirre stood very loudly. And from his seat as our diversity, uh, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion coordinator, he stood up and said no. And we all followed. And the immigration detention center didn't come. The business community said, no, we don't want that here. And it said, went away. We've been standing with immigrants in terms of going to the state house and talking to our legislators about driving cars. Senator Blake Doran, Joanna King, state representative Joanna King. They're trying to get on board. They're, they're moving the needle for themselves. Okay, great. Move the needle for many others in your party. Great. We're standing in the gap of offering immigration workshops to people who need immigration workshops. We're standing in the gap of helping create a hope network, helping other people everywhere hope. We're building funds. We're building hope by having partnered with the Mexican consulate to offer scholarships the young people that we match. So now we can tell a lot of parents, your Mexican government in your country is actually helping your child go to Goshen College. Come to Goshen College. We're creating leadership programs for young people where we're asking them to be a part of learning how to lead things. We're creating opportunities to change the way we interact with one another by being intentional in the types of events and things that we host. How many of you were at last evening's uh, Performing Arts Series concert? How was that? Great. Now, call and response, call and response. Yeah. I heard loud, because I would agree with that. <laughs> I was at the front, and I had like, kind of like this ringing going on in my ear. Okay, audience. Wow. So culturally, the type of music that was brought last night to Goshen College is not one of it's not bad, it's good. But last night's music. The cultural experience was one of participation. It was engaging the people to actually see themselves and transport themselves to their home country because they no longer live in their country. It was an amazing experience. Goshen College is engaging in that to really kind of think of the frameworks that we're working from we sort of say, what are the frameworks of perception that we have of this new population that is here? That's a question for College Mennonite. What is the framework of perception of the people that have arrived at College Mennonite? What are the things that you have thought of, of these people, of these individuals over the years that are now in your midst? And they are here. So we have to dig deep what we're saying that at Goshen College for our faculty and the curricular change in the way we're doing convocation and the, and the speakers that are coming. We're asking ourselves, what is the framework for why we're doing this? And we're saying that we have to feel the pain of what people are experiencing. So there's a lot of pain of not being able to feel as safe as some of us might feel in this community. It's the reality of it. Every day, there are people that leave their home that do not feel safe, period. 
whether you agree or disagree with the policies that are in this country, people fear to go to work. The decline in the students of Mennonite, the Mennonite students at Goshen College, and someone will have to tell me how much time I have because I, I don't, I'm not watching, about five minutes, great, perfect. I didn't bring my guitar, so you all won't have to I'll stay a little longer. <laughs> I would say that there are some very key fundamental things in terms of our planning that have been going on at Goshen College. And one is, while we know that there is a decline in Mennonite students, and we know that that decline is actually bringing students who are more conservative. So what we don't know, or what maybe you don't know, is that there are more conservative evangelical students at Goshen College today than there were 10 years ago. Why do y'all think that is? <clears throat> Sixty-one percent of students are what? Local. Most of the students that live maybe outside of Goshen, maybe in Goshen, probably more conservative theologians, as well as Latino students, Latino families also tend to be more conservative theologically. October 31st, 2014, College Mennonite Church Chapel had 450 Latino congregants from all Latino congregations across this region. They had a celebration called Una Noche con Jesus, A Night with Jesus. In 2014, I don't know how long we've been going with the process of becoming a more open church for Latino and then in terms of Embajadores de Cristo that started a number of years ago. But in 2014, in your chapel, in your congregation right there, there were 450 Latino individuals worshiping God. I don't know how many are at the 1111 service. But your journey as a congregation is people all around us here are worshiping God. And most of those, I would say most of the congregants that came to this congregation on October 31st, 2014, from 6.30 to 8.30 to 9, probably 9.30, they are all conservative theological individuals. I know a lot of them. I don't know, all 450. But I know their pastors, and I know what their pastors preach from the pulpit. But Latinos can also be more progressive on social issues, immigration, specifically, food, security and security, jobs, education. This country has not seen the numbers in terms of the dropout rate for Latinos has not been the, it's been, it's not been this lowest in decades. 39% of the incoming class to Goshen College this year were Latinos. 39%. So Latinos are valuing education, just as you have valued education for your grandchildren. Those parents are also valuing education. What I'm saying is we have had to really hone in on our values, on our Anabaptist values of community, of following Jesus, and being sisters and brothers to one another, no matter where you come from. And in this work that we're doing at Goshen College of being a more of a Hispanic serving institution, I think we're really we're really trying to think of we want to expect the best here. We want to expect the best for everyone that's in this process. And we're paying attention to the change and adjusting where needed. So we changed our housing policy a few years ago. Because 
Latino students, we know based on the financial trends, they are they are running about twenty to thirty thousand dollars less of income than their white counterparts. Ocean College and uh, all along the ways until probably the early mid two thousands was an on campus residential institution only. You had to live here three years, four years on campus. So if you came from Ohio, you're going to live in the. If you came from Goshen, you came from Ligonier, you came from Indiana, you're going to live on campus. Three percent Latinos in two thousand. Thirty nine percent incoming class. Fifty percent now live off campus. So let's do the math. Let's do the financials. If you remove. 20% of that student population at Goshen College today, financially, what happens? So we've had to adjust. It's not a financial game, but it is a reality game. Goshen College is a not-for-profit. It is a business, and it needs to... Put people through the education system. And we're really working hard at telling the story. Goshen College is a place where it has been welcoming Latinos for decades. Yeah. It's natural to be doing this. There's nothing wrong about doing this. It's, it's not even do the right thing. Goshen College was doing the right thing. Since 1929, in different iterations, beautiful. And we're celebrating together the work that we're doing. And hopefully in this work of being a Hispanic serving institution, you all as being a college Mennonite church who is welcoming people who are coming from different parts of the world and more particularly Latino, that you might embrace them as individuals that God has sent to this place to live and to interact and to build and to grow, and that it is God who will do that work and not us. And we will just participate and join with God. And hopefully, we can set the example to others across the state. There are state, there are, and I'll end with this. There are some schools in Indiana who they are having a really hard time financially. I have to admit, they're really having a hard time financially. Their Latino population is 4%, 8%, 9%, 10%. They are struggling. The work that we did and the work that you all are doing today as you look at your congregation and it's building and it's growing, I think for Goshen College, we might say to you, continue to pay attention to what the Spirit is saying to the church, to people who sometimes come to us that are the least of these and those who need support, those who are immigrants, those who are in need of care and love. Will you pray with me? Creator God, we thank you for College Mennonite Church and the journey it is to become an intercultural congregation, knowing that your spirit has walked and moved in this place for many, many years, and that you have begun this work many, many years ago. I pray that as the congregation unfolds in this work, that it may be patient with you, and it may be patient with one another as they live and dance with one another and walk with each other and intersect and interact with one another and that your Holy Spirit guide and direct them in all they do, knowing that they will be different because they paid attention to you and not to themselves. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you.